With the NBA season in full swing, baseball getting underway, and the NCAA tournament and Masters right around the corner, the sports calendar is officially heating up. And that means now is the perfect time to take your sports fan couch experience to the next level by getting in on the action yourself. The Athletic has partnered with BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks, to bring you the latest odds and exclusive offers to bring you closer to the game than ever. Subscribers of The Athletic get in-depth analysis from our newsroom, plus insight into the latest betting trends and odds from BetMGM's team of experts, getting you the context you need to nail your next pick or parlay. I was looking at NCAA tournament odds today. Michigan is plus 600 to win the whole thing. I've had a good time watching that team, so that's a little way to add some excitement to your tournament watching beyond your typical bracket. Right now, BetMGM is offering the Athletic Football Show listeners a risk-free first bet up to $600. Just sign up at BetMGM.com and use the bonus code MAZE to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sportsbooks. This offer is for new customers only. That's a risk-free first bet up to $600 at BetMGM.com with the bonus code MAZE. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. Cue the disclaimer. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Nevada, and Virginia. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800-889-9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Promotional offer not available in Nevada. This is the Athletic Football Show. Welcome to the Athletic Football Show. I didn't realize we'd have all the bells and whistles in the introduction. I really enjoyed that. I'm Robert Mays. Joining me today is my good friend, Lindsay Jones. Lindsay, how are you? I'm good. Happy almost New Year, Robert. (laughs) <laughs> what if we did I, our real new year's this way like we had two I, days leading into new year's i i really enjoy the fact that i screw up the free agent calendar every single year we were gonna do something on wednesday because that's when free agency opens i've only covered the nfl for like seven years so by now i should know that all of these deals were going to roll in on monday so we decided this morning let's just go with it because it's been a really fun day of nfl news i want to kind of add some urgency to the way we recapped it. So we're going to talk about some of the initial reports from the free agent signings that we've seen. As you guys know, this is live. It's 4.20 p.m. Central Time right now. So there might be some more. I mean, and reacting to them in real time is always really fun. So let's start with what you floated as now I understand is a joke way to start the podcast no, no, no. Well, as a dig at me. <laughs> but you, as soon as the Joe Tooney signing happened, you said, this is how we're leading the show. I just assumed you were serious. But... Well, I am serious. Okay. So let's start but... with that. So I obviously... am serious, but I also know that there's nothing in the world that you love more than some super sexy, hot interior offensive line play. Well, you're, you'd be surprised at my reaction to this then. So the Chiefs go out. They sign Joe Tooney of the Patriots, formerly of the Patriots, to a reported five-year, $80 million deal with $32 million fully guaranteed and $48 million and practical guarantees because of an injury guarantee that kicks in next year. So this is shocking only in that a week ago, it just didn't feel like the Chiefs were going to financially be in the running for guys like this. But after cutting both of their starting tackles, they had some money to burn and they had to remake their offensive line. And they made a very, very splashy move. $16 million for Joe Tooney resets the guard market and gets another high-priced guy from outside Kansas City onto that roster to go along with guys like Tyron Matthew, Frank Clark. They have not been shy about taking big swings. This one is at a slightly less exciting position. Let's just say that much. It is, but it's so necessary, right? I mean, I think when you looked at, you know, or when I was looking at the Chiefs heading into today and this week, they had to do something on the offensive line. I was kind of keeping my eye on Trent Williams, if that was a guy that they might try to make the really splashy play, because Clearly, there's a need for a left tackle there. Um, But, you know, instead they went with Zeitler. You know, at this point, I'm not going to rule Veach and company, Veach and uh, Andy Reid out of any sort of free agent market, any sort of position that they might want to go after. But you would think that this would take them out of the running for for Trent Williams, who, you know, has not yet re-signed with San Francisco. I know the Niners were kind of hoping to get something done with him. But, you know, look, they, 
at this point, there was only one returning starter from the Chiefs' Super Bowl win on that offensive line, and that was uh, Lorraine Tavarney Tardif, whose name I always mispronounce, who didn't even play last year. This has been massive turnover on that entire offensive line, and we saw in the Super Bowl how badly they really need good offensive linemen. So they had to be aggressive. They had to spend a lot of money. I don't know if it's the best value deal that was out there, but when you look at a team that has needs and going out and getting the best player available at that position, that's what the Chiefs did here. So I think the number of holes along the offensive line is why this is a little bit curious because I think signing an interior offensive line in free agency is typically a safe way to spend your money. We'll get to a couple of the other ones here in a second because I feel a little bit differently about those than I do about spending $16 million a year on Joe Tooney. They're going to have a very solid starter. He has been one of the most reliable offensive linemen in the NFL since he arrived into the league. He's never hurt. He plays every single snap. And one of the things I love with free agent offensive line additions, positional versatility. He can play center in a pinch. He's done that well. He can play tackle if you need him to. That's great. But the a guard, no matter how good he is, only moves the needle so much. Is it smarter to say, all right, instead of $16 million for one guard, here's $8 million for one guard, $8 million for another guard. What can we do at tackle? It's possible they looked at the market and what they might be able to do in the draft and said, this is the best way to upgrade the positional unit. That's totally reasonable. But I still think we haven't seen huge guard deals move the needle that much. I like spending free agent money on the offensive line not in more cautious ways, but just in more measured ways that spread it out a little bit more to fill holes rather than try to look for difference makers. And the amount of money they gave Joe Tooney on this deal, they expect him to be a difference maker at $16 million a year. And, you know, I, it's always about weighing value and what, what does this team want? What do they need? And right now, when you talk about what do the Chiefs need, obviously they need tackles. And I think that's important. But it's what it's those things that you just mentioned. It's consistency. It's the, uh, it's a guy who's going to be reliable. It's a guy that has position versatility because that's what they didn't have last year. And it really came, it really came back to, to bite them when they were trying to move guys around in the playoffs and heading into the Super Bowl and just didn't have kind of the, the right people there. I'm very curious where they're going to go from here. I mean, there was a report a couple of days ago that they were looking forward to bringing Mike Remmers back, which, I mean, if you want to bring Mike Remmers back to be depth at one of your tackle positions, that's great. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm Patrick Mahomes and company, I'm feeling great about, you know, <laughs> Mike Remmers as being one of your long-term answers at one of your tackle positions. This is a really good tackle draft you know, they do, you know, they're not picking till 31. That's kind of a ways to go to maybe get one of the best tackles in this draft, but it is a position that they might be in a better position to address in the draft this year than you are in a typical year where tackle might not be, might not be quite as good. So, you know, I, I just thought it was an interesting move that the chiefs kind of went in. They also did a bunch of restructures, um, Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes, Chris Jones, all got restructures on their deals um, earlier to start the week so that they have a little bit of flexibility. So I'm curious to see where they go from here and kind of, um, yeah, what goes next? What are you going to do with those tackle decisions? I mean, it's possible that they looked at the available tackles in the market outside of Trent Williams and just said, we don't want to overspend on one of those guys. Because at tackle, that's typically what happens in free agency, right? We have teams that spend because there's such a scarcity at that position, and they typically get disappointed. Those guys don't live up to the deals that they receive. At guard, that doesn't typically happen. They're fine, and they play up to that level. But again, uh, how much is a guard moving the needle and where could those resources have gone? So I'll be really curious how they fill those other spots. You know, we looked at what the Bucks did last year and picking a tackle in the first round, having him start from day one and being an all pro. That is not an advisable strategy when you're trying to figure out how to plug holes on your team in a given year. So if they're sitting there and thinking at 31, we're going to find our starting left tackle, that's a very dangerous game to play. It's great if it works out, but... You know, I think the Bucks got a little bit lucky there, but Bruce Arians should be um, should remember just what value he got out of his rookies last year when he's talking about how you know lack of an off season will hurt rookies because they won the Super Bowl in part because their rookies were so good. But yeah, so we'll we'll see what happens. So the other offensive line big moves of the day were Corey Lindsley going to the Chargers. Um, he'll be their new starting center. I know you uh, have studied a lot of Green Bay offensive line 
tape over the years. So what did you think of that one? That, that deal got done very shortly before we started uh, recording. Yeah, I don't, I don't even have the details in front of me because it happened so quickly, but he's going to be the highest paid center in the NFL uh, by everything that's been reported. It, the AEV is, or is not even in uh, spot track right now. So let me look at some of the deals. So five years, 62 and a half million, which I think this is an interesting conceptual question. How much do you value center? And if you value center a lot and you think that it provides stability and can be kind of a force multiplier along your offensive line, it can make the guys around him better, it can ease the burden on your quarterback, then signing a center in free agency I think is a really smart move. It's worked out for a lot of different teams over the years. You look at some of the recent free agent center signings. Mitch Morse has been really good for Buffalo. I think he's been really good for Josh Allen. Ryan Jensen, again, going back to the Bucs, has been great in Tampa. He's been everything they wanted him to be after coming over from Baltimore. Alex Mack was really good in Atlanta. You know, that was one of the key pieces in turning that offense into the best offense in the NFL when he got there with Kyle Shanahan. So are the Chargers looking at Corey Lindsay and thinking, yeah, it's a lot of money, but it's a safe bet. If we have him for the next three years playing at – even if it's not an all pro level like he did last year, but a step below that, if he's one of the best five or six centers in the league, is that worth it because of how much he's going to help Justin Herbert, how much stability he's going to bring to the offense, everything else. I tend to think spending on centers is worth it. And that's why I think it's a great move. I think it makes all the sense in the world. And it's actually a pairing that I kind of had circled as free agency was even getting started. Yeah, Shil Kapadia uh, predicted that one. You know, he did his kind of dream scenarios for all of these free agents, and he wanted Lindsley to end up with the Chargers. What do you like about Lindsley as a player, and what makes him special as a center, do you think? So smart. So, so smart. I remember a story uh, my, when I wrote about him back in 2014. I did a story on the entire Packers offensive line, and he started early in his career. He got thrust into the starting lineup because I believe it was J.C. Treader got hurt, and he had to play and start in Seattle against that Seahawks team the year after they won the Super Bowl. And he told me a really funny story about that. But I remember Josh Sitton telling me that Corey just caught on to something. It's called a cross key. It's just something to kind of that younger players wouldn't necessarily notice as things were moving full speed. And he caught it like right early on when he was playing. And Josh Sitton is one of the smartest offensive linemen you'll ever meet. Anyone, everyone always says this. And he just saw Corey recognize that and was like, that's a really smart guy. And he's shown that, you know, I think that it took him a little while to get totally comfortable in their new system when Matt LaFleur came over. But when he settled in, you saw what he can do in year two of that system. Again, I just think an amazing stabilizing factor for a group and an offense that desperately needs it. They've been searching for answers along the offensive line and even at that position for years. They've had so many guys cycle in and out of those interior line positions in San Diego and LA. And I just think this is a great way to find a solution that gives you some reliability in a spot where they haven't had it at all. Especially now when everything is about making things easier for Justin Herbert. Mm -hmm. And you know, you want to get tackles, obviously, but you know, if you got to get somebody else on the offensive line, it's going to be that center. So I just love that the philosophically what the Chargers are doing there and where they're going to spend their money. And yes, he's going to be at the top of the market now, but you know, everything it's, it's now all in with your rookie quarterback. He's on a rookie quarterback deal. So um, I, I really like that move. And then the the other side of the value for the, for the interior offensive line would be um, Kevin Zeitler, who was mm -hmm. cut by the giants signed by the Ravens this morning. I believe it's seven and a half million dollars. Um, so that's not as a, a massive deal. I mean, you're, that's certainly not it's a great, great contract. It's it's yeah. a gr it's a great deal. It's a, it's such a Ravens contract. Getting a guy who was cut for half of what Joe Tooney is going to make every single year, and he doesn't contribute to the comp pick formula. So they let Matt Judon walk. They're going to get a third back, and they sign Kevin Zeitler for half of what guys are going for on the market. He's a little bit older than Tooney is. Obviously, he doesn't have as kind of you know, blemish free of a track record, but I still think that he is an immediate starter. He is an upgrade for them. And I think he's going to be really good. I, and as soon as I saw that, I was just like, yep, that makes total sense. I completely understand why they'd want to go that direction. And the poor Bengals fans, right? I mean, so for, for days, weeks now, right, we've all been hyping up the Joe Tooney 
going back to uh, Cincinnati, where he's from. Then, you know, Kevin Seitler, there was a lot of maybe he could go back to the Bengals. And then this morning, now they're both off the board by the end of Monday, including Seitler, who was very popular in Cincinnati before he left for kind of a big money deal in free agency a couple of years ago. Um, I forgot he, left, he even played on the Bengals. Right? So, but there was, became this hope of like, he he could come back. So it's like, oh, we're going to refortify this offensive line. We're finally going to protect Joe Burrow and all this stuff. And now both of those guys are gone. And Zeitler now is going to be in Baltimore and have to face the Bengals twice a year. I think that's okay, though. I, I don't want Bengals fans to freak out. I want <laughs> I want Bengals fans to take a step back, take a deep breath. It, the people who win free agency for interior offensive linemen on day one, it, it's not necessarily a sign of what's to come. You absolutely can find solutions at that position that are a little bit cheaper. You can spread out your money. Again, I mean, Mitch Morse was a big signing for the Bills, but if you look at some of the other things the Bills have done, and I think they're a really good example of how you can make free agency work for you. If you look at other things the Bills have done, especially on the offensive line in recent years, it's more modest deals. You're just plugging holes. I actually like that as an approach in free agency along the offensive line. If they end up getting a Matt Filer for, I don't know, three or four million dollars less, maybe not three or four million dollars less than Zeitler, but like a little bit cheaper than Zeitler, if it's six million dollars a year, that's okay. It may not be as big a name, but I just think that if you're finding solutions along the offensive line, you're doing okay. And you can find those solutions a week into free agency, 10 days into free agency. It doesn't have to be in the first three to four hours. So any Bengals fans that are creeping toward the bridge, like it's all right. It's going to be fine. Like, just calm down, take a breath. There are still going to be players available that can help you. Well, that's, I think that's the message for basically every fan base outside of New England. Yeah. Here, yeah we're sitting shocking. here at 5 30 Eastern on Monday. And here's the, most teams are not active. Like, the, the official market hasn't actually opened yet. And if you check Twitter around the NFL, it's fan bases are going, what are they doing? What are you waiting for? Why are there been no deals yet? except for New England, who um, I believe that Bill Belichick has been body snatched. Um, I do not know what has happened to Bill Belichick over the last 24 hours or because he's just been handing out deals left and right. I mean, they have basically signed guys for as much money this week than they have in like the last five years period. So what, what do you think? I'm looking What's at going it right on? now. So 53.2 million in guaranteed money over the past three off seasons, according to PFF. They've spent 52.8 today. And some of it is understand. So I, I go back <laughs> I'm and sorry, forth. I'm sorry, I see this picture all of a sudden. <laughs> Where's the dog pick, Kent? If you're going to throw that up there, I want the dog. So I, there it is. That a boy. That's what I like to see. So I understand some of it and I, and I don't understand some of it. I feel like the overall aggressiveness is a sign that they're not desperate, but they need solutions. You know, they, in a way, last year, got to see how the other half lived. They became a normal NFL team. And I think that's kind of created a little bit more desperation and urgency over there than you'd have in a typical offseason. They have money to spend and they're going out and getting guys. The Johnny Smith contract is massive, but he instantly becomes their most explosive pass catcher. They needed something on that team. We've seen what they can do with tight ends in the past. It's been a spot they valued. Four years, $50 million with $31 million guaranteed is a lot for Jonu Smith. But if you increase his role, he's going to run some more routes. He's going to be a bigger piece of the offense. I can understand that. The one that's kind of curious to me is Matt Judon. And it's for this reason. I think scheme fit-wise, he makes perfect sense. You know, if you look at the ways they use their edges, they want those guys to be versatile. They want them to be able to do a bunch of different stuff, whether it's blitzing, stunts, being able to cover in certain situations, being physical with tight ends. I think he perfectly fits their defense. But because they've pieced together their pass rush for so many years, they don't pay edge rushers. That Because they're non-traditional in the way that they deploy them, they haven't paid those guys at the top of the market. And that's why going out and spending this much on one is a little bit surprising to me, even if he does fit what they want to do defensively. And this is going to put him, I mean, it's not a top of the market pass rusher, kind of edge rusher contract, but it is going to put him in the top 10 for outside linebackers, which it's just such a, it's, it's like you said, it's just such an unpatriots like way to go about paying guys. So I'm just really, really curious to see 
what what's changed in New England? Why are they all of a sudden feeling like they can you know, spend all this money? The other guys that they signed today, cornerback um, Jalen Mills was um, was the other one. And then who am I missing? Who's the fourth guy that I'm uh, getting off the top of my head here? It's not on my list either. I, I don't know who the I, – I, we'll, we'll find one in a second. Jalen Mills, I, I think that if you look at that, again, it makes sense, right? He's somebody who has positional versatility. He moved to play safety last year, playing closer to the line of scrimmage. We've seen all the things he's done in the past at those different spots. How well he's done that is a different question. I mean, you're really betting on New England's ability and that coaching staff's ability to extract the best out of him. They might be able to, and they love having all those different kinds of defensive backs that can do different things. But is there some redundancy with Kyle Duggar, who they picked? What, what is, how does this fit in with Devin McCourty's future? All of that. Again, they're paying a lot of money for somebody who was not very good at times in Philadelphia. But like you asked, why are they doing this? Because I, they know they need answers. They know that they need answers immediately. They looked at what happened last year. And I've got to think that they came away thinking, we can't do that again. We cannot have a roster that, that's talent, that is that talent deficient again. And this is how they're addressing it. It's shocking. But after last year, I can understand why they wanted to go this direction. So when you look at the rest of the AFC East, you know, I think the Jets were the team that had a ton oh, of Devon money Godshaw to spend. Oh, Devon is the other guy they oh, signed. Devon Godshaw, yeah. tackle from, for, from uh, Miami, which makes yeah, sense. It, it, positionally, I think it does. Didn't love the value on it. I think just in terms of how much that it's day one of free agency, man. There's not going to be many value propositions <laughs> here, which that's why it's surprising. The days of Bill Belichick laying on a dock while everyone else throws their money around, those days are very gone. We have moved very far away from that. To be fair, he might be on a yacht right that's now possible. somewhere yeah. or, you know, sitting on a dock in Nantucket while he's making these calls. Everybody learned they can do all their work from home now. So, um, but I just, I think it's, an, it's interesting where, you know, kind of going into this week, you looked at, okay, who in the AFC East can spend money? The Jets are at the very top of the list of, you know, who they, who they want to go after. I think interior offensive linemen was a position that they were going to be very interested in. Didn't get any of those top three guys um, available that we just talked about, whether that was Timmy or Corey Lindsley or even Kim Seitler. Um, I believe they spy, they signed um, Gerard Davis from the Lions. You know, so you know they got kind of the top linebacker or one of the top linebackers who is available. Um, but Miami has been really quiet so far, and you know, and Buffalo has been fairly quiet so far. Besides signing, re-signing some of their own guys in recent days, Matt Milano last week, John Feliciano over the weekend. Um, so, what do you think when you look at the AFC East now? Um, just kind of that 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 landscape of that division. Well, a few with hours Buffalo. in. With Buffalo, I mean, all, a lot of that news happened over the weekend, right, where they signed Matt Milano to that deal, which we hit on last week's show. But then you have guys like Feliciano coming back. And it's interesting because the Bills were aggressive in free agency over the last few years, but it's mostly because they filled so many different positions in free agency. They weren't spending at the top of the market. They were doing a lot of, all right, let's sign – two interior pass rushers. Let's sign a couple different edge guys. Let's sign a couple different receivers in that eight to $10 million range to try to piece it together. But now they've found those guys. It's a lot easier to sign players to big time extensions or to hand out a little bit more money when you've seen them in the building. We'll get one to one of those deals here in a second. But I just think it's a lot safer and GMs are a lot more comfortable when you know the people that you're handing that sort of money to. It's a lot easier to sign John Feliciano to a multi-year extension when you've seen what he does in your offense. Same goes for Jared Williams, who they re-signed. And that's what I think we're seeing. I think we're seeing the Bills understand the formula they followed last year worked. Let's do everything we can to retain that. And that's why I think the Shaq Barrett thing is so fascinating. So the Bucks, I love the fact that Bruce Arians, however many Coors Lights deep he was during that parade, screaming, you guys aren't going anywhere, you're all coming back. And he actually meant it. Like every single person at that Bucks boat parade was that dude at two in the morning who's like, we should hang out more. And they actually meant it. They like, this is the first time that everyone was very drunk and throwing around all these lovey-dovey statements and actually followed through on them. And I just think it's fat. I mean, the deal itself is four years, 72 million, which is tolerable. And if you're looking at the edge rushing market, it's a little bit less 
than guys at the top of that market have made. And this is just a reminder that if you want to keep everyone, you can. It just requires some sacrifices later on. Brady doing that extension and adding all of those voidable years to those deals, that puts them in a position to be aggressive in ways they hadn't before. The One of the reasons that they've been able to do this is because they had no dead money left on their cap. They didn't push money into future years ever. And if you don't have any dead money, that's when the cap is fake. Because then you can do all of these extensions and play with the numbers and everything else. And they were able to do it pretty comfortably. I mean, this isn't something where they had to do all these crazy restructures. It was only one or two. So they really did put the band back together. Were you surprised that they were able to do this? Or did you think that this was always in the cards for them? I mean, I know that they wanted to. I mean, yes, they were, you know, kind of like drunk and really, really happy at the boat parade. But they were saying that within an hour of the Super Bowl ending, that Sunday night in Tampa, um, Bruce Arians was very clear that this was something that he wanted to happen. But, you know, you get a month into it, the agents start talking to each other. You know, the one common thread through a lot of these deals that we've seen today is that most of these guys are represented by Drew Rosenhaus, who's yeah. not necessarily a guy who is known for, you know, having his clients take below market deals or team friendly deals. Um, Shaq Bear could have gotten more. If he wanted yes. to, if Shaq Barrett had wanted to reset that market, had wanted to be, you know, have the deal that everybody was doing, the, the eye popping emojis and the holy crap, I can't believe how much he got. He could have done that today. Somebody would have paid him at the very top of that market. Um, you know, they probably got some calls, you know, really checked out to see exactly what other sort of offers were out there Monday morning and then decided, do you want to break the bank? Or do you want to get a very good deal and go back to a place where you know you're comfortable, the scheme fits you, your family is happy, and you could potentially win another Super Bowl next year? And and Shaq Barrett was a guy who decided to, I'm going to stay here. And, you know, look, the, the, the Bucks have been very good to him so far. I mean, they brought him in when there wasn't a huge market for him two years ago. Um, you know, they, they kept him on the franchise tag last year with, a, with kind of the understanding of, we will make this work for you. And come here, we're going to win, we're building something special, and then it's going to pay off. And ultimately now it is, it's paid off for Shaq Barrett. And, you know, good for him. I mean, he, you know, he probably could have gotten a little more, but this is by far the best situation for him. And it's the best situation for the Bucks as well. It, it, the same thinking applies here that applied to what we're talking about with the Bills. You bring him in on that one, sh one year short-term deal, he gets the tag. Now, when you're him giving him this massive contract, some of the downsides and pitfalls we normally see with free agency disappear. You know what kind of guy he is. You know how he fits into your defense. You can have an understanding of what that contract is going to do to his production and everything else. So it's worth taking that chance because you're no longer concerned. You're no longer concerned with, all right, what is this going to do if we give this guy all of this money? There's a certainty there, and that allows them to sign this deal without any hesitation where they couldn't have done that two years ago. So, and you get a slight discount because of the culture that you've built. He wants to be there because of what it feels like there. And in order to understand that and come at that lower price, you have to have him in the building. You have to make the initial signing two years ago, the way that they did it. All right. We're going to keep breaking down some of these signings before we do that though. Let's take a quick break. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Blue Chew is making waves and bringing more confidence to the bedroom. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. Blue Chew's tablets combat all forms of ED and can help men gain extra confidence for when it's time to perform. Blue Chew is an online prescription service, so no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And it ships right to your door in a discreet package. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com Consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try BlueChew free when you use our promo code MAZE at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com promo code MAZE to receive your first month free. And we thank BlueChew for sponsoring the podcast. This is why this is fun. As we were waiting during the break, Ian Rapport reporting, 
the Raiders are close to a deal with Yannick Ngakwe. Makes total sense. <laughs> this is becoming an annual thing with the Raiders. They get very excited about the shiny guys in free agency. They pay them top of the market money. And then two years later, they do the whole thing again. Kidding aside, I completely understand why they want to do this. He's a guy that has had fantastic production over the course of his career. I think that there's probably a reason he changed teams twice over the course of the last year. There are some concerns about what he's like in non-defined passing situations, how good of a run defender is he, everything else. But this is a team that desperately has needed to upgrade its pass rush. He is a very good pure pass rusher. What do you think about Ngakwe to the Raiders, even if we don't know the price yet? God, he's a perfect Raider. Like he was born to be a Raider. <laughs> like, I'm, at this point, I'm stunned it hasn't happened yet. This is going to be his fourth team, and I'm just stunned. Like he was born to, to go play for the Raiders. Just I think personality-wise, he fits. He I mean, he obviously fits the mold of a Raiders free agent signing. Um, I hope doesn't. I hope that doesn't mean that he's going to end up being kind of a bust because that's what's happened, unfortunately, in a lot of the Raiders' splashy moves over the last couple of years. Um, but you're right. But you're 100 right that he fills a massive need. And if he can become a really good player every down um, where he's not kind of just a third down threat, you know, I think this could be a really, really good signing. I do want to see what the value is over there. The Raiders do have a history of overpaying guys. I think that might be the polite way to say this. So, you know, we're waiting to see exactly what these, what these terms are going to be, um, are going to be here, but um, you know, they play in a division where there's a lot of really good pass rushers and they have not had any. And I think they're all just tired of answering those questions about who's going to rush the passer. How are you going to get off to the quarterback? They've tried to address it a lot of different ways over the last few years. None of them have worked since getting rid of Khalil Mack and that trade a couple of years ago. So maybe this can partially be that answer, but I just, I think it fits. He's going to look really cool in silver and black. You know, he's got like the most ridiculous crop, cross chop uh, move in the NFL. So I'm excited to see that. Um, but I just want to see kind of where he goes in this next phase of his career. I mean, last year was just so tumultuous going from Jacksonville to Minnesota, then to Baltimore, changing schemes, changing defenses, the whole thing. So now, you know, now at least he'll get to be settled. He's got a long-term contract for we'll see exactly how much money soon. Um, and now the Ravens, I mean, I don't think it's surprising that Ngakwe and Judon were both going to end up leaving. But the Ravens now have to completely remake that position as well. So this affects a couple of AFC teams. Yeah. I mean, the Ravens are in their normal thing where they let a pass rusher walk in free agency, get the comp pick a year later, pick a pass rusher with the comp pick, let the pass rusher walk in four years, get the comp pick back. It's a cycle that keeps continuing. I The Raiders, if you look at the way they've spent, obviously they've been really aggressive in free agency over the last few years. The hope has to be, that now with Gus Bradley in there, that scheme-wise you can start getting the most of some of these players. I think that some of the bets they've made were probably misguided from the start, you know, whether it's Cleveland Farrell with the fourth overall pick, stuff like that. They haven't been consumed with value in the way that they've spent some of these resources, but I do think it's not an accident that those guys consistently have underperformed when Gunther Cunningham. Not Gunther Cunningham. Paul Gunther was there. Now, hopefully, with Bradley coming in, you know, we've seen what he can get from Joey Bosa, Melvin Ingram. Maybe there's an uptick in the production from some of these additions now that they have a little bit of a better chance schematically to get started here. Also, right. now that you mentioned Gus Bradley, Gus Bradley was the coach in Jacksonville when Yannick Ngakwe was drafted. That's right. It's a, known, it's a known quantity. Ngakwe had some of his best seasons playing for Bradley. So didn't put those two together until you mentioned Bradley and then it clicked. Um, so there you go. When, when it's a guy who maybe has had some, you know, he's a fiery guy, right? He's gotten into disagreements with teammates and stuff, but Bradley knows probably how to handle him and maybe how to get the best version of Yannick Ngakwe. So that makes even more sense now that, now that you put the defensive coordinator and player together. I think that you know, it can be funny sometimes when you have these guys with previous connections that, that drives free agency. I mean, you think the Bills, they've signed so many former Panthers, but that matters. If you know the guy's personality, if you know what he's like and what he is in certain situations and how you can use him and everything else, it eliminates a layer of risk from this. And when you're spending what I assume is going to be, I don't know, $18 million on a guy, you want to eliminate as much risk as possible. And I think that Bradley's familiarity with him is a way to do that. So let's get to another defensive signing in the AFC that I absolutely love. 
and that's John Johnson to the Browns. Three years, $33.75 million, $24 million guaranteed. The Browns' plan this offseason was very simple. They had a lot of money, and they were going to spend it on defense. If you look at that defensive depth chart, Miles Garrett, Denzel Ward, and I guess Grant Delpit, he didn't really play last year, but that was it when it came to building blocks that they had on defense. Other than that, they could kind of paint this defense the way they wanted to and use their resources to do exactly that. And I think Johnson makes perfect sense. They're going to be able to line up him and Delpit and Ronnie Harrison together. I think that's going to allow them to marginalize the linebacker position even more. I don't expect them to sign one. So I really like this. I think this is a perfect signing in terms of need and a perfect signing for where modern football is headed. What was your reaction when you saw this one? Uh, love it. It was one of my favorite moves of the day. I'm working on a piece that's going to be published later to, uh, later Monday evening on The Athletic about kind of superlatives about the day, good value, favorite moves, teams that maybe overspend. And I was having a hard time figuring out exactly which category to put this signing in because I think it's a really good value. I also think it's a really good fit. So, um, you know, it's, an, it's he's making a lot of money but he's not resetting the safety market. And, you know, I, th I think it's just a good value for the Browns and they had to get better on the back end of their defense. It was one of the biggest questions. Every single game that we talked about the Browns late last season, as they were making that, that push where they were in the, even in the running to win the AFC North, they had to figure out, they just didn't have great answers in their secondary. And John Johnson is going to give them so much flexibility. He's able to play all over that defensive backfield. He's going to be a really good leader. He's got, um, he's just kind of like a tone setting, fiery kind of guy. Really, really liked him. If you watch Hard Knocks at all last summer, you, you really liked John Johnson. Um, He's learned from a lot of really good guys. You know, he played alongside Eric Weddle for a couple of years and he picked up a lot, I think, from him. So I just, I think it's a really good culture fit. I think it's a great scheme fit. And I'm really, I'm just really excited about that move. If, if you're the Browns um, and you're a Browns fan, they haven't signed a pass rusher yet. It might be coming. There's still, there's still a few really good pass rushers available on the market. Um, but this, this is a great one. You went and got the best safety that was, out, that was out there and you didn't have to spend a fortune to do it. I love it. I, I just think that if you look at what he did for the Browns last year, really a ton of awareness, just a really smart player, very good in zone coverage. And you look at that very complicated zone defense the Rams played last year. He was just so comfortable. Also, their signal caller, their defensive play caller at that spot. I just think having that sort of leadership, intelligence, everything else, as they try to remake this defense is interesting to me. And I know that they're going to try to find some pass rushers. You know, I don't know if they'll be at the top of the market for a guy like Trey Hendrickson or a guy like Carl Lawson, or if they'll try to piece this together. I wouldn't be surprised if they were a team that was trying to get Judevian Clowney at a discount. If somebody that really they could just drop in to be a chaos creator along that offense, along that defensive line with Miles Garrett, that kind of thing, where they want to try to find values and piece together the pass rush more than saying we need a $15 million a year guy to pair with Garrett. So I'll be curious how they go about that. But again, all they want to do is add defensive talent and defensive explosiveness. And that's where they're starting with John Johnson, which is great. So one more big signing here before we get out of here, Romeo Aquara back to the lions, three years, $39 million makes sense to me. I, I loved him. I thought he could help out a lot of teams, but if you're a Lions team that's trying to retain young talent, trying to build this team from scratch, essentially, especially on defense, he's a really good young piece. So it's not surprising to me that he would want to stay. Yeah, I mean, I think our Lions guys were a little surprised that he ended up coming back. I think maybe they just thought he would have a really good market and just might mm -hmm. want want to go somewhere else, you know, when you look at kind of where the Lions have been. But well, his brother's you know, there too, right? Which yeah. is, I think, is something to consider. Yes, his brother is there, and now they're going to kind of be the building block pieces, potentially. I believe that's what Chris Burke, our, um, our Lions beat writer, was uh, was writing earlier today. But yeah, it was a little bit surprising that it got done for him to stay and for it, that deal to get done early today. But you look, I think there were a lot of defensive guys who played for the Lions and were maybe misused over the last couple of years who maybe didn't reach their full potential and, you know, have good talent. And now they can you know, maybe get into a different scheme, a different coaching staff and might have uh, a little bit more success. So 
you know, that was a position that the Lions decided to spend at. They didn't have to, you know, break the bank. I mean, this is not, you know, three years, 39 million. That's not, that's not a massive deal. I think that's kind of in the range of a lot of the deals that we're going to be seeing this year, you know, not market shattering type of contracts that are getting handed out by any, by any means. But, you know, it's good to have a little bit of consistency there because they are losing a lot of their other impending free agents. A couple quick ones here before we get out of here. Jason Verrett back to San Francisco on a one-year deal. Love it. He was great for them last year. One year is five and a half million. If he plays at the level he did a year ago, that's a huge bargain for a team that I think is trying to figure out what they want their secondary to be with guys like Kwan Williams and Jaquiski Tart, others hitting free agency. And Darius Williams, first round tender from the Rams, 4.8 million. He was fantastic last year. So two NFC West corners that know the systems they're about to play in, the everyone, the coaching staff, everyone is familiar with them there. I think that makes sense to me. And then Roy Robertson Harris, who I think a lot of other people don't really know about. If you're like not like a football person, I, I think he's probably somebody you haven't watched a lot. He was excellent in Chicago. Long interior presence. He goes to Jacksonville. And then I think somebody who plays a similar role or played a similar role in that Bears defense in Denver for Vic Fangio is Shelby Harris, who, again, I you know Shelby Harris, but I think other people are probably surprised – at the money that Shelby Harris got, where do you think Love he fits Harris. into? Where do you, where does he fit into the Broncos' defensive plans in your mind? Yeah, well, I mean, they you know, they they already let go of Drell Casey, they let go of uh, AJ Bouye. so a lot of the guys that they spent money on in recent years um, that didn't work out, and now he's going to kind of be the focal point of that defensive line, at least at this point. So Shelby Harris was a guy that they got real cheap a couple years ago. He left to test the free agent market last year, didn't find a massive market, came back to Denver on a one-year deal and was their best defensive lineman, you know, outside of Bradley Chubb, you know, but he was their best like interior defensive lineman, play in and play out. Um, just a really good dude too, just like really lovable. Everybody, you know, everybody loves him in that locker room. And um, I'm glad to see he got paid and he had to be a priority. And he's just like a great like Vic Bangio guy. And the thing that Shelby Harris is known for is he has these just massive hands and he backs down like a ridiculous amount of passes. Like, I don't know where it's come from. He's blocked multiple field goals, but I really was happy to see him sign in Denver. And I just think when you, when you talk about a guy like him and the two cornerbacks that you mentioned with uh, Darius Williams and Jason Barrett, you know, and then even to Shaq Barrett, the biggest moves, and I think the best moves that often happen in this phase of free agency are the guys who re-sign with their, uh, with their previous teams. We get really excited to talk about these guys changing teams, the potential like big money that's getting thrown around for guys to move and switch teams. But ultimately, the decisions or the moves that are going to impact teams the most, a lot of times the guys that they keep, the guys that they don't let get away. So I think all three of those are really good examples of, you know, smart signings, value signings, guys that, you know, they, they just value them and they didn't let, ultimately didn't let them leave the building once uh, the market opened. And the same goes for Michael Davis, the cornerback from the Chargers who just re-signed there. I mean, they are in full evaluation mode about how they want to shape that defense. They seem to think that he was a fit for what they wanted to do. He's back playing for Brandon Staley, which I'm very excited to watch. He's a long, talented guy. I think that makes total sense. That is all we got. We have to get out of here. I will be back tomorrow doing the same thing with Nate. On the podcast version of this, we're going to have Jeff Schwartz coming a little bit after we recorded that late last week. But as far as the live stream goes, that's all we have. Really appreciate you guys checking in. We'll be back over the next couple of days recapping all of the madness that is going to happen. Lindsay Jones, thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank, we made it through the show without my uh, my preschooler bursting in. It was some we're, sort we're of just, a miracle. We're crushing it. This is, It's been a <laughs> great day. All right, guys, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.